our city in ashes. 3,000 homeless and destitute. Will your government do something for us? Such was the pathetic wire sent to Prime Minister Sir John A. Macdonald in Ottawa by Mayor Malcolm McLean, which told the world that the fledgling city of Vancouver on Canada's remote west coast had been wiped out by a devastating fire. Vancouver, only a few months old, was still popularly called Gastown, after its most flamboyant saloon keeper, Gassy Jack Dayton. It was a thriving town of five to six hundred homes, hotels, stores, business buildings, mills, saloons, churches, fences, wood and dirt roads, and wooden sidewalks. Every day, it grew just a bit larger. A bright and glorious future stretched out before the town. Then, without warning, fire. And within minutes, Vancouver was gone, wiped out, totally consumed by angry, hungry, orange and red flames that licked the city clean. It was a sad, a horrible day, which is recorded in history as Black Sunday in Gastown. Sunday, June 13th, 1886, dawn soft and fluffy. The sky was cloudless over the North Shore Mountains, still snow-tinted from the winter. Not a breath of air rippled the placid waters of Burrard Inlet. Slowly, reluctantly, Gastown stirred as the Sabbath began. By mid-morning, a gentle wind brushed over the town, but it was apparent this was going to be another hot, sultry day. Like the others since May 26, the last time rain had fallen. In what is now Vancouver's commercial heart, between the older East End and the more modern West End, roughly from today's Main to Camby Streets and from the waterfront to False Creek, the city's 3,000 residents went about their Sunday routine. Some went to church. Others packed lunches and went on picnics, either into the quiet and restful woods or down to the shores of Burrard Inlet. A few, mostly loggers, stayed abed, sleeping off the effects of the regular wild Saturday night whoopee. In the saloons, which outnumbered churches 20 to 3, the theme was to have a hair of the dog. Families gathered for the usual post-church Sunday dinner. Others wandered around the town aimlessly. By noon, anxious to make overtime pay, crews were out in the woods logging, slashing, and stacking trees as they cleared roads and selected areas, one of which was to be the site of the old Hotel Vancouver. The wind freshened, and by early afternoon was blowing a full gale. Then, about 1.45, sparks from the clearing fires carried by the wind showered like rain over the embryo city. The little town and its environs seemed to explode into a great ball of fire. And within 45 minutes, the city was a smoldering skeleton of blackened, ugly, wooden ruins. A dead thing wrapped in a pall of dense, purply black smoke. That was 80 years ago today. To recall that Black Sunday in Gastown, CBC Radio looked up a number of Vancouver's senior citizens, then just children, and asked them to remember the sights and the sounds and the smells when the Great Fire wrote its fiery entry into the city's history. These are their memories. It was after lunch, and uh, Mother had been to church and came home and had dinner, and Father went to lie down for a little while. And someone knocked at the door and said the fire had been started. The CPR had big piles of uh, slash, you know, piled up re ready to burn. And they thought this Sunday it was rather calm that some man volunteered to go out and set that. Well, then the wind came up. And, of course, that was the end of Vancouver. It just swept through the little part that was Vancouver at that time. Father got up and um, went out to help him uh, fight the fire. And it was so near our place that uh, Father and this chap volunteered that he never knew who he was and never was able to locate him afterwards to thank him for what he did, moved us out on the lot and the furniture. The fire had surrounded the house by that time, you see. And um, this chap and father 
got some blankets, so they kept dipping the blankets in a ditch or a pool or some body of water near the lot and put it over Mother and my sister and I to keep us from being burned. And the sparks of the fire made holes in the blanket and set my hair on fire. There was a soda water factory a few yards away from our place, and it blew up. Mother thought that when the roof blew off this uh, soda factory, that part of it blew over on top of our stuff, and that set a, a very bad blaze, extra bad blaze. And um, an extra big spark had lit on the blanket and burnt quite a bit of the hair off the back of her head. She had, she had pretty curls, and they were gone. It was a very hot, sultry day, and uh, we'd been to church and came home and had our lunch. It was a bit smoky. They were clearing Vancouver off. So Father had taken his stuff out to um, Falls Creek two or three times, thinking the town might be burned, and had to bring it back again. We were quite safe, so he wasn't worrying very much, although it was a little bit smoky. But about uh, somewhere between one and two o'clock, a man came to the door, and Mother went to the door, and she, he said, you better uh, get out of here. The town will be burned up in a few minutes. So Father went over to a stable that he had rented to a teamster in Mr. Hill to get a rig to get our stuff away. Mr. Hill was loading his own stuff into the rig, and he said he wouldn't have room for any more than his own stuff, but he'd come right back. And he was going to go to um, Falls Creek about Main Street. So he said if uh, Father would uh, pile out what he wanted taken away, have it ready outside the house, he'd have it all ready. When he came back, he'd take father's load. But he never got back. The uh, fire circled the town, and by the time they got their trunks and furniture and clothing out, it was too late to leave the lot even. So father took us down to the back part of the lot, where the CPR track ran through at the corner of our lot. It was quite a bare spot there, and we crouched down, and. Uh, Mother held my sister in her arms, and I crouched beside her, and Father said to keep our heads as low as we could. And he got a couple of blankets, and he'd run and uh, soak one blanket in a pond or a little stream and uh, come back and put it over us, and uh, then he'd pull off the one that was on us and go and soak it. And uh, it seemed an awful long time <laughs> sitting there, but. They said the town burned down in three-quarters of an hour, I don't know. It was a hot day, but uh, we had just moved. We lived at the corner of Abbott and Water Street. And I remember my parents had been up for several nights or a week before at night, expecting the fire, you know, the house to burn at any time because there were clearing fires uh, close by. But uh, my father had built a home at Falls Creek. That's where the stations are now. And we had moved a week before the fire. But our house was burned that we had lived in. And um, what I can remember are the crowds of people around. The house, I think, was built on the land. And then behind was a shed and a stable and they were built on piles. False Creek came in there at the time. And I can remember the people being around, sleeping in the barn, beside the horses, you know, and in the shed. We looked out our window, what my father did when the church service was going on. It just looked like a great big pile of brush was burning. He said, uh, there's a fire down in, in Gastown. He said, just look at the smoke. Oh, it would be spread along like, well, like a block or two, you know. It only seemed like that to us, but it was, it was only in the bush, you see, you couldn't tell. The sky was all lighted up at night, though. It uh, didn't stop burning. People got away from it, you see. And especially when there was, they throw the bark down. It would be fire, fire, fire. All of a sudden, there was a cry of fire. Well, there was a trucker down below us there, and he immediately hitched up his team and came up to our home. And uh, we loaded 
everything on that we could on the truck, and, and um, he took us down to uh, Falls Creek, or the bridge there. We had uh, to get out pretty quick because it only took 45 minutes to, uh, to clear the town and burn it right down. The Methodist minister, sometimes one, sometimes the Reverend Joseph Hall, sometimes, mostly, used to come out on Saturday, ride his horse, you see, and he left it at our barn, took our boat, went down to Richmond, and had the service on Sunday morning. Then he came back to our place and had his dinner and, and had a service at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And he was having the service when my father was sitting on like this over again, only in old lounge, and he could, he could see the smoke. He stood as long as he could, he said. And he went home, he, and he knew the minister's family was down in Gastown, you see. So he said, that looks to be a big smoke downtown. He said, perhaps you like to know. Oh my, he says, I think I better go then. So he closed the service and went off. He had a wife and three sons, three small sons, but he couldn't find them. But after a long while, he found them, somebody had taken them on a raft out in the, out in the water. They, were, they say, I don't remember much about it, but they said there was a lot of people who got into wells and that. I remember them saying there was 13 people were dead because they got into these wells and the heat was terrible and they smothered. When we got down to the bridge, we were staying there for a few months. There's no grub in the city at that time. Uh, it had been burnt up again. But Mother used to bake her bread every Saturday and got a big boiler of bread and that. It was divided among the children there at the bridge. Uh, there were two hotels there. A man named Austin had one. The other one was owned by Mike Casella, who afterwards built the commercial there on Camby Street. A few minutes after the fire was on, they, they began to bring the burnt bodies down there, and then they turned the Costello Hotel into a morgue. And there was 11 bodies. I can remember it quite well because it disgusted me. There were 11 bodies stood along the floor there. And they were all badly, but it was terrible. It's like one of them was still alive. It was terrible. There was a soda water factory a few yards away from our place, and it blew up. I remember the terrible noise it made, like a blast. And uh, Mr. Fawcett, who owned it, and the family were making for the inlet for safety, and he remembered that his gold watch had been left on the desk in the building. So he turned back and got in the building that was burned to death. And uh, there were some very terrible incidents of that kind. Well, after the fire had subsided a bit, Father got Mother and us down on the track and led us down to the Hastings Mill. And on the way, he saw a man in distress, terribly burned, and he was crying for water. Father stopped a minute, took the man's hat, and got some water. I suppose there were water running on each side of the, this cut. He gave him the water and went, took Mother and I down to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cordner, who lived at the Hastings Mill, Mrs. Cordner had been a school teacher down there. And when he went back, this poor chap had passed away, with many others lying along that cut. Two men um, were found under a building. I didn't see it, but it would be up near Main Street on Hastings, a hotel that was being built, and the, um, apparently three sides of it was boarded in. And they must have taken a shortcut in going from Hastings to Cordova to make for the uh, inlet. And when they got to the other side, they couldn't get through and they were burned to death under the building. But uh, quite a few people, uh, so many young folks, young men had come from the east, you know, to make their fortune. And they would be up late Saturday night. Some of them were sleeping in their beds when the fire broke out. And uh, some people thought that quite a few were burned to death, that we'd never know who they were or what happened to them, anything about them. While I was talking to the old timers, they hinted several times at thrilling escape stories of the fire, incidents which they didn't actually see themselves, but had heard about. So off I went to the history files from which I drew this one as related by the late C. Gardner Johnson, a shipping operator whose firm still operates in this city. 
Here's Mr. Johnson's story. All west of Carroll Street was a mass of flames. I could save little from the office. Running back along Hastings Street, I was called with others into Balfour's Hotel to help save it. We did so, throwing water from the inside against the pieces that were burning. Shortly after, I opened a door to the south. I was horrified. I saw that we were trapped, entirely shut in, the fire having jumped a clearing, making one solid mass of flames and dense smoke from Carroll Street to Main Street. We must reach False Creek. So we tied wet handkerchiefs over our faces and rushed the danger zone. John Boltby, George Bailey, a bartender, and a stranger were with me. Outside of the hotel, a demented man was trying to save a small pile of wood by throwing water from the side of the road onto it. I entreated him to join us, but he did not, and he was later cremated. We then crossed as far as Pender Street, where the fire met us like a wall. Our clothes commenced to burn, our handkerchiefs dried up like chips. We decided to lie down flat on the gravel. The fire might pass over us. To the westward side, a large frame house was on fire, so close that the burning timbers came falling down on us, causing us indescribable agonies. Bailey couldn't stand this. He decided to get through at any cost. But he couldn't penetrate a foot into the flames. His cries were heartrending. After running around for a few seconds, he dropped and burned up before our eyes. His charred remains were picked up later. The roar of the fire, the flames, and smoke engulfed us and reminded me of my childhood pictures of the terrible bottomless pit. My brother-in-law, John Boltby, and I bade each other goodbye. We each promised to look after the other's family if one of us happened to perish. They were terrible moments. Our clothing was burning. We would pat each other to keep the flames down. Consequently, our hands were badly scorched. An almost unbelievable incident here occurred. The stranger with us, who had been very silent, was lying to the leeward side of myself and Mr. Boltby. Suddenly he exclaimed, Mr. Can you pray? Maybe God will make it rain if we ask him. I told him to pray for himself too. Then I asked him to give me a handbag that he had put at my head as I was lying to the side the wind was coming from. He handed me the bag. I put my head closer to it as far as I could in the gravel. I had hardly done so when an indescribable commotion occurred right around us. Dazed, I exclaimed, What can that be? The stranger stammered, Those are my cartridges. The fact was that he had a loaded revolver and a box of cartridges in the satchel, and they had gone off taking fire while my head lay against it. Miraculously, not one of us was harmed. We lay in agony for a while longer. Then suddenly we discovered that the fire was lessening where we lay and was passing to the eastward. We decided once more to try to reach False Creek, which we did by crawling, sometimes reaching water, then coming to land and making a dash towards the bridge. I soon reached our cottage, outside of which my wife was standing. I was too overcome to speak to her. One story of a miraculous escape from the great fire, as told by the late C. Gardner Johnson. But now, back to our pioneers and what they remembered of the day of the fire, that memorable June 13th, 1886. We went back the next day, and uh, there wasn't a sign of the house there, and we couldn't tell very well because the whole thing was just burning and ashes. And there was uh, some rowdies around. They happened to get a hold of some whiskey there, and when we got down, they were 
having a high old time <laughs> drinking this whiskey that they found after the fire. Our home was burned completely to the ground. There was nothing left but ashes. And the furniture was all burned, with the exception of this sewing machine. And that was covered with, the furniture was covered with blankets too, I believe. But that all went up in smoke. Mother said afterwards, no one had a sewing machine, so it was put in a tent, and everybody who wished to use the sewing machine to make clothing for their children and themselves, I suppose, because everything was lost. Mother had come home from church and changed her good clothes, as we nearly always do, you know, to do a little work. And so she had nothing but a little house dress left on. And my eldest brother was born six weeks after, so she wasn't in very good shape at that time. I went to Vancouver the day after the fire, and I remember there was a bridge there, you know, across Walsh Creek. And I remember that that bridge from one end to the other was full of uh, furniture and feather ticks. You know, they, had, they used a lot of feather ticks in those days, and, and the people had got away from the fire, and they got on the bridge. And the bridge was full of people from one end to the other, and what little bits they could save, they, could save, they, they brought it on there. And I remember the, the chief of police, Chief Stewart, and his daughter was there, Jessie Stewart, and she came and talked to us as we went by, and, and she said they had slept on the bridge all night. There was no place to go, you see, no hotels, nothing left. But there was one hotel, and what we call East End now, I remember them saying, oh, I thought it was funny, because there was so many, I remember them saying, well, that's a temperance hotel. But what they meant by that, I don't know. <laughs> Down there, when we went there, it looked to me as if uh, the bushfire had started and went over and just left logs. It looked like a lot of logs. We went down a different time. They had the, the council meeting, I suppose it was, in a tent. And the, the, the mayor and them were had, had the meeting in the tent. And I thought that was funny house for the mayor to be in. McLean, I think, was his name. I'm not so sure. But uh, all the rest was blackened, you know, just blackened over what maybe pieces of buildings and logs that they built the houses on. Oh, by the way, a curious coincidence. The Great Fire swept Vancouver to the day, 94 years after Captain Vancouver had discovered Burrard Inlet and the area that was to bear his name, June the 13th, 1792. The hardy citizens of those days, 80 years ago, began to rebuild the town which was to become Canada's third largest and, in the minds of many, Canada's most beautiful city. Major J.S. Matthews, Vancouver's peppery archivist, says this about the city that grew Phoenix-like from the ashes of the Great Fire. Goodbye, Granville. The embers of the first Vancouver were still smoldering when the present city arose. Sunday saw ruins, Monday saw the new yellow scantlings, a color harmonizing with the black desert as the new city rose. Take what you need, quoth the Hastings sawmill, and open their lumber yards to all. Historic Granville, alias Gastown, had vanished. Nothing remained save indomitable men and courageous women. Out of the black dust that arose in the short span of a single life, and like a magic thing, a great world port and a great metropolis of beauty, of culture, of monumental edifices, luxurious offices, beautiful residences and green lawns, the happy home of an enlightened and benevolent people of peace and goodwill. There is not in all history, regardless of time or place, a more splendid page of human achievement. All courage is not of the battlefield, nor fame of marble halls. I asked Mr. George R. Gordon, of Survivor. What rebuilt Vancouver, Mr. Gordon? And he answered, Faith, it is all we had left. Vancouver senior citizens who remembered the great fire of their childhood 80 years ago were Mrs. John McKee, 
Her sister, Mrs. W.M. Draney, Mrs. Gertrude E. Gow, Mrs. Eliza Jane Beach, and Alex M. Matheson. Research by Jaime Koshevoy and technical operation and tape editing by Elmer Winton. Black Sunday in Gastown was written and produced by Bill Herbert of CBC Special Events, who joined your announcer, Bob Switzer, as narrators for this special broadcast from Vancouver.